Okay, one week away from cutdown day. One preseason game to go on a 53-man roster projection podcast with notes from my film study of Saturday's game at Green Bay. We must start in the obvious places. Taylor Swift and owning your baldness. Okay, both topics brought to you by uh, FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Because this morning on WEI, Bill Belichick, of all people, copped to unofficially being a Swifty. He shared he watched some of Taylor's concert in a rain-soaked Gillette Stadium the other week. He named a song. He described her as tough, very impressive. The song he, he referenced was you need to calm down. And I promise we'll get to the serious content here in a second. But I just wanted to start there because, man, I just think we've got to remember to laugh. Like Isaiah Bolden's family had the scare of a lifetime, obviously, Saturday night when he's immobilized taken off on a stretcher in Green Bay, okay? It's a concussion. He's in good spirits, according to Belichick. My colleague, Doug Kide, uh, confirmed a report from Mark Daniels that he has a concussion. Um, and as we get close to the season, I get that everyone's a little bit anxious about the offensive line. You're excited about Mac. Can't wait to see Pop Douglas. I'm in the same boat. But against the backdrop of last year, when we spent so much time, okay, in just the misery and the muck of the 2022 Patriots and then reporting it on my end, you just got to remember to find the feel good and some laughs. And so I did this morning with might be Belichick's quote of the year <laughs> when we go back and look back in January, February. So I just want to put uh, pass the along. Speaking of laughs, I shouted out the most recent reviewer of this podcast over on Apple, who among many kind words left the note that I quote, own my baldness. I love that. I shared it with everyone uh, who was, you know, within walking distance and showed it to my phone. And then obviously on Twitter with the folks on the internet. That person, I believe, heard the call that I'll ready right now is that if you like this show, please do one of a few things. Rate and review on iTunes and Spotify because we are growing. After your plus, we are in a great, great spot with the show. We have new sponsors coming up next month, okay? Any kind of feedback is welcome, but the five-star ratings, the reviews, the feedback you give us, really, really helpful. Or second, you can support the people that support us, okay? I mentioned FanDuel already. They have tons of Patriots bets. Could be for the season. It could be for the opener. It could be player props. I don't care what it is. If you think the Patriots are going to be better than people expect, just better than seven and a half wins a season, you can bet that at FanDuel. Or the Red Sox might wait the playoffs. They have a big series tonight, starting in Houston. I'm not betting on football. I'll bet on the Red Sox. Do it at FanDuel. Support the people that support us. Again, the link's in the bio. Uh, FanDuel.com slash Boston. Okay, on to the football. First and foremost, I'm going to give you your vegetables first, and you're going to like it. Uh, and if you have a mailbag question or watching this live on YouTube, feel free to drop it in. Again, when I say the feedback is welcome, throw it in there right there. I might shout you out, even if it's not a question. But if you want to know something, that's why I'm here. Back to the vegetables, though. So I have four takeaways from my film review post on the BostonHerald.com. Watched every single play uh, from the suspended game against Green Bay on Saturday. Patriots win, quote unquote, uh, 21 to 17. Takeaway number one, this was in the headline. This was in all of my tweets. This took up the intro of the article. Mac Jones was terrific under pressure, okay? Three of four, according to my charting, 45 yards and two sacks. And the one incompletion was a deep ball to Devontae Parker that, frankly, among, among deep balls, uh, was as pretty as they get, okay? And we spoke about this last episode with Doug Kide. Mac hitting Parker in stride in a deep ball was the first time we had seen that. He did it Thursday, one or two-minute drill, huge play. I thought it was a moment. That incompletion was this close to being another one, okay? Now, on the other passes that he did complete, again, under pressure, so he's either getting hit uh, or hurried or obviously sacked. He had an RPO slant to Kendrick Bourne. Kendrick Bourne on a dig route. That was the one KB skied for. got with both hands. And in third and 10, he hit DeMario Douglas in the same drive. It was like a little deep curl. Douglas settled in against soft zone. So Mac playing well under pressure, which generally is actually kind of a noisy stat, meaning it's not always meaningful. It's not consistent year to year. And we could do the you know, small sample thing. But when you're at one end of the spectrum or another, okay, amazing under pressure, a la Tom Brady, or Mac Jones, which we saw last year, and I've said this many times, second worst passer under pressure last season, according to PFF, third worst uh, passer rating under pressure, also courtesy of PFF. We talk about the power of sample size, right? Like if you have a small sample, but it's screaming in one direction or another, that can still tell you something. And it told me starting in August of last year that Mac had a real issue. I don't know if it's cured yet, but this was a huge step because Mac playing well under pressure, third down man in his face, red zone. Do you take a sack, throw an incompletion, or fire a touchdown pass and thread the needle? Will make the difference between a good season and a great one. So preseason, again, doesn't tell us a whole lot. Four passes, six snaps under pressure doesn't tell us 
a whole lot. But considering the difference of what we saw last August, and he's just peeing down his leg would be a little cruel. A step above peeing down his leg, okay, against the Panthers and then in Vegas at any sign of pressure versus this is a huge, huge difference. And again, my favorite example, talk about ugh, small sample size, guy shows up at your pickup game, hits two three-pointers, gets a steal and then a block, and is throwing down a windmill dunk at the end of the end of the court. I've seen enough. You know that guy can play. Mac under pressure, This performing this well is a really good sign. Okay, number two takeaway from uh, Saturday's game, the pass rush stunk. Okay, there's no need to cushion that or soften it or anything of that ilk. Zero pressures from Matt Judon, Josh Uche, Christian Barmore, Lawrence Guy, and Divide Godchow combined. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. Nothing. No one on the team had a sack. No one had as much as a quarterback hit against the Packers' backups. Now, Dietrich Wise did have two hurries. So did Daniel Aguale. This was good. But of course, this had to happen after I write for our, our Sunday edition of the paper, a long piece with quotes from the coaches, glowing quotes, included a lot on Keon Light, who didn't play, that this could be the best pass rush of the Patriots uh, have had under Bill Belichick, and perhaps by extension in franchise history. Okay, that story needs to be tabled. That conversation, which I sparked, uh, can, can can be snuffed out right now. We, we, don't, we don't need that right now, uh, because this was... A step below alarming. Like you're throwing up a yellow flag here. Something to kind of take a look at. Because Packers have a decent offensive line. But without David Bakhtiari, there's no real special talent there. And on the first snap, forget even just pass rush for a second. Todd Godchow is getting thrust three yards backwards by Josh Myers, their center. Uh, What was another issue with the run defense? But the pass rush as a whole. No sacks, no quarterback hits. It's just not going to be not going to be good enough. Um, All right. Scrolling down here, looking through some comments. Just want to check in. we got two more takeaways. Uh, Zappy's going to make me look like a clown. That's that's a good one. Hey, you can bet on that uh, at FanDuel probably. Um, more Mac talk. Again, if you have, <laughs> thank you, Ahmed, our producer, putting up that with the comment with the clown. All right, here we go. Number three, Malik Mania. Takeaway from Saturday's game. Uh, it took a hit, okay? It wasn't that Malik didn't catch a pass on his five targets. It wasn't that uh, he didn't play quarterback at all. It's that Malik couldn't separate on short, intermediate, or deep routes, okay? They threw him into the fire on kick return. Not much there. And I'm not burying the kid, but I'll just say if you went back and, and listened, maybe even to this podcast or certainly some some TV I did the days after Malik had that one drive, not even a quarter, not a game appearance against the Texans. And we're talking about his future as an NFL player. Is he a backup? Could he start? Is he a package player? Could he replace Billy Zappi? Uh, you know, even even this season as, as Max's primary backup. It all sounds ridiculous. OK, you laugh. He's clearly not ready. And the same reason we should have pumped the brakes then, though, is the same reason we should do it now. The mania can be tampered down. It's just to understand that what we mostly know about Malik Cunningham is the same stuff we mostly knew before the draft. He's an undrafted rookie, or just just after the draft. He didn't get picked. He's transitioning to a new position, and that's really hard. So expectations for this kid, who now has to divide his time between playing quarterback and receiver as he tries to make the team, it's honestly made it harder on him, and I think you saw that. Again, Zero catches and five targets. Not all his fault, but uh, it just, even the plays when he wasn't targeted, not a lot of separation there. It's just kind of stocked down for Malik. Last one, aside from Malik Cunningham, um, Patriots wide receiver core should have you really encouraged. Okay. Kendrick Bourne was terrific. The aforementioned catch on a a slant. He also had one on the dig. He had an out route start. It's one of Mac's favorite throws. It's just KB and a little out route. He's in the best shape of his life. It's a contract year. He's got his life squared away off the field as far as people I've talked to close to him. Uh, him and Demario Douglas showed out. Devontae Parker was the MVP, very officially, courtesy of the Pats Interference Podcast, to join practices. So there's depth there. And that's without Juju Smith-Schuster, your new number one receiver, or Tyquan Thornton, uh, who has been out since landing hard in Thursday's practice after catching a bomb. So the receiving core as a whole, because of what they did in that game and what we saw in the days before in joint practices, should have you encouraged. All right. We are getting to the 53-man roster projection. This is the only one I am going to do all summer, so I would pay attention. They have two more practices, Tuesday and Wednesday this week, preseason game Friday, and that's it. So most of the hay, as they say, is in the barn, if they still say that. We have a lot of old phrases that come up in this podcast. Please, anyone who has an explanation for the hay being in the barn, which I suppose just means a long day's work is almost done on the farm, where most people were working 200 years ago. Uh, But we we were wondering about the chips being down last week. Someone help us on the phrase front. In the meantime, as I mentioned, FanDuel is here to help you win all season long, whether the Patriots do or not. And here's the deal. 
Right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner at FanDuel, you will get bonus bets every single time that Patriots or another team wins in the regular season. Just pick a team to win the Super Bowl at FanDuel, and you will get bonus bets every single time they win. Then you can use those bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, more. I don't care what it is. I've already said go over on 7.5 of the Patriots win total uh, and visit FanDuel.com slash Boston for all of that, where you can start earning your bonus bets on America's number one sports book. FanDuel, that's FanDuel.com slash Boston. Okay, on to the roster projection. One week to go. This is where we're at. What I decided to do for this, instead of just the traditional positional format, okay, quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, skip a few down to linebackers, long snapper, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go in tiers, okay? There are a lot of guys on this roster that we knew before camp even started, before one Belichick blowing his whistle, Mac throwing, you know, a seam ball to Hunter Henry, again, on his list of favorite things if you were listening last week. They're just making the team, okay? Because job security in the NFL is not necessarily tied to your ability or your production, okay? It's about who are the guys around you, positional depth. It's about injuries that crop up during the summer. Your draft status absolutely buys you a longer leash in the league in salary implications. So here are the tiers, okay? Number one tier is called... You need to drop burning dog poop at Robert Kraft's front gate to lose your job. A lot of guys in this category. Basically, again, you made the team. Tier number two, made guys. Okay, You can't cut a made guy. can't whack a made guy. These are shoulders. They're part of the family. All in all, most likely, they're also going to be made part of the team. Number three, there can only be one. A couple of uh, head-to-head positional battles where these guys are either going to get a job or be on the street. And it'll be because of, most likely, another person on the team. Uh, Number four, bubble boys. And number five, we have our Turk targets. Uh, For those who don't know or haven't watched Hard Knocks or been around an NFL organization, the staffer, it's not a ball boy, but someone lower level in the team who starts with telling the players on cut down day, hey, uh, coach wants to see you and bring your playbook. They call that person the Turk. Okay. So again, these are Turk targets, guys that, you know, all due respect to the uh, Brad Hawkins hive or the Trace McSuper fans. Or Jeremiah, big time farmers. Uh, you know, it's just they're not making the team, and we all know why. Okay, so tier number one again, you need to drop burning dog poop at Robert Kraft's front gate if you are not going to be on this team week one. Um, and one other quick note here we have four guys still on PUP or NFI. I'm leaving Calvin Anderson on NFI, non football illness. I think because of how long he's been out, he's got to add back some weight, let alone practice. I did activate Mike Gunwenu because Doug Kide suggested in this podcast he could be ready for week one. Um, also doesn't seem to be dealing with any weight loss. He's just recovering from an injury. Trey Flowers and Cody Davis, though, are going to stay on PUP. Those guys, uh, only Unwenu will count against his total 53. And the other guys are going to miss at least four weeks. That's the new rule. You have to miss four weeks if you start the season on PUP or NFI. Okay, again, you have a job. Tier number one, quarterback, Mac Jones. Running back, Ramondre Stevenson and Zeke Elliott. Zeke's here. He's making the team. Uh, receiver, Juju Smith-Schuster, Devontae Parker, Kendrick Bourne. That's it. Hunter Henry, Mike Kosicki. Offensive lineman, aforementioned Mike Wenu, Trent Brown, Cole Strange, David Andrews. Defense, up front, Dietrich Twice, Devon Gachow, Ken White, Christian Barmore. Don't worry about a thing. Linebackers, Matt Judon, Josh Uche, Juwan Bentley, Marte Mapu, Jelani Tavai. We'll talk about him. Cornerbacks, John Jones, Jack Jones, Marcus Jones, Christian Gonzalez, Miles Bryant. We will also talk about him. Safeties, Kyle Duggar, Adrian Phillips, Jarrell Peppers, Jalen Mills, special teamers. Again, just kick your feet up, take an off day. Matt Slater, Brendan Schooler, Chris Board, brought over from the Lions, also had a holding penalty in the Green Bay game. Bryce Barringer, who's just, the man is. (laughs) I feel like I should just have Alex Barth, noted uh, punting enthusiast back in the pod to talk about hang time because I had 4.89 on his 61-yard punt. And then he hit another one that was over 70 or at 70. Um, the, the kid's making the team. Six-round rookie. He is a punter. And then Joe Cardona. So, of all of those players, again, you are making the team. You have to do something dastardly to get knocked off the roster. That's 35. That's 35 out of 53 roster spots already booked. Okay? Three players I want to talk about. Uh, Tavai and Bryant. Jelani Tavai and Miles Bryant. I know, at least from my mentions, Bryce Boominger, that's a nice one, Patrick. Thank you for dropping that in the comments. Still live here on YouTube. Um uh, the Patriots like Jelani Tavai and Miles Bryant more than you do. And I think 
Jelani Tavai, based on his play last year, should have won those of you over who were very upset that he made the team in the first place, which I think was just guilt by association in his part. Matt Patricia drafted him. He overdrafted him. Tavai stunk in Detroit. Now he's here. This is Patricia's fault, blah, blah, blah. Patricia's gone. Tavai, meanwhile, is probably going to start week one, depending on the personnel that the Eagles trot out in their first offensive snap. He can play off ball. He wore the green dot against Green Bay. Okay, he's your signal caller because Juwan Bentley didn't play. And he can move on the edge. He's a steady, reliable guy. He's on a cheap contract, also contributes on special teams. That is someone who really needs to screw up to lose his job. Miles Bryant, okay, another common target for Pat's Twitter. I get it. Guy's five foot nine, not particularly good in man to man coverage. Everyone still remembers the day after Christmas in uh, 2021 when the Bills came in here, didn't punt, and Miles Bryant was getting smoked by Isaiah McKenzie. Here's the thing about Miles Bryant, though he played 60% of your defensive snaps last year. He only played seven at Green Bay. Again, when players like Godshow and Barmore are playing a lot more than that. So right now, based on how they're using Marcus Jones, who I thought would be their starting nickel, and maybe it's Jonathan Jones, but he's hurt. We haven't seen him, and he might be needed on the outside. Miles Bryant is your starting nickel. So he's in this tier. They like him more than you do. He can, I think, is very serviceable as a backup in several spots in your secondary, including free safety, by the way, which he played in the preseason opener. He's making the team. Last one, Kendrick Bourne. Only reason I bring him up is because I had an inkling, you know, just like last year, Patriots got many, many trade calls about Kendrick Bourne. Um, And I was thinking, you know, this might be an opportunity for them to sell a little bit higher. That was a big reason they didn't do it last year. You're selling low on a guy who's not playing well, who's your fifth best receiver coming out of camp last summer, producer's doghouse, blah, blah, blah. They're not trading Kendrick Bourne, to my knowledge, this time around. Tyquan Thorne's injury probably factors into that again. Uh, But Demario Douglas coming up. Parker and Juju at the top, I thought maybe this is an opportunity that they'll see maybe as a trade asset and a deal for an offensive tackle if they want. I was told no. Um, So that's where we are. 35 players already on the books. Okay, to tier two. These are made guys. Soldiers, they're part of the family. Can't whack a guy, can't cut a made guy. Here we go. Quarterback, Bailey's Abbott. Running back, Ty Montgomery. That's it. Wide receiver, Demario Douglas. Again, that's it there. Offensive line, Riley Reef, City Sow. Antonio Maffi and Jake Andrews, who we have talked probably the least amount of all the offensive linemen that should be on this team. And that brings us to uh, three running backs, four receivers, and eight offensive linemen already. Defensively, made guys, Lawrence Guy, Daniel Ekawale, Carl Davis, linebacker Mac Wilson, Anthony Jennings, and special teamer Chad Ryland. So again, we're going to talk about a couple of these guys. Much smaller tier. This is 13 total players, in my opinion, between guys who are definitely making the team. 80 to 90% making the team in this tier, 48 out of 53 spots already. Let's start with Ty Montgomery. Just like I told you about Jelani Tavai and Miles Bryant, the Patriots like him more than you do. They like him more than I do, okay? But remember, this was a guy who was starting week one as your third down passing back. Zeke Elliott, yes, he's here. But there is nothing Kevin Harris or Pierre Strong, currently injured, could be back this week. We'll find out in practice tomorrow that is done to inspire and say they deserve a roster spot here, and they're coming up in the next year. Ty Montgomery, on the other hand, is someone they value not only as a running back who can catch passes, moonlight as a slot receiver, but also covers and special teams. None of this is supposed to excite you. None of this is supposed to persuade you. I'm just telling you the way that the Patriots see this. Now, his injury, of course, has kept him out uh, for a while. We have seen him at practice, walking around, coming in late, walking. Seems to be fine. Not a doctor. I don't know. But... Based on their history with Montgomery, how cheap he is, how he impacts two phases, and the lack of positional depth around him. Again, they just signed Zeke Elliott for this. If they expect Ty Montgomery to be healthy, based on everything else we've seen around Ramondre Stevenson, I don't know who's beating him out definitively for a spot. Now, would I keep him on the roster? I don't know. But this is my projection of what the Patriots will do. About a week out from cutdown day, right now, if he's healthy enough to play week one, I think he's in. Uh, Riley Reef. Reef is an interesting one because, again, he started camp, two practices, right tackle. Next day, we saw Connor McDermott at right tackle. These were non-padded practices, not an evaluation period, according to Bill Belichick. But we really haven't seen Riley Reef at right tackle since, and that was supposed to be his job, according to the Athletics' Jeff Howe. He's been at left tackle because Trent Brown missed some time. But since then, he's been at right guard, which I think is just a stopgap, right? Mike Owen, who's been out all summer, you need someone at right guard. There's a body simultaneously. You give City South, fourth-round rookie. Some time at right tackle. Let's see what you got there. He can only, you can only learn about City South if you play him. So they have Riley Reef at right guard. But what if Riley Reef is getting the short end of the stick here? 
Like he's not getting snaps at right tackle and left tackle where ideally he would be your swing guy or your starter at right tackle. So I'm not saying they're going to cut him. I just have left confidence than I did at the starter camp because he's not playing the position he was brought in here to play. And they're extenuating circumstances. He's a guy who fits the program, exact type player you want. I'd love him to be a swing tackle as opposed to a starter, but this is where we are. Maybe City Sow ascends and develops enough in time for week one to be the starter. And that's exactly what Riley Reef becomes, your swing tackle, because Michael Wine is back and he can play right guard. Or maybe it's Riley Reef right guard. Or maybe it's Riley Reef on the street. I don't know, but it's an interesting case. Uh, Jake Andrews, I mentioned, fourth round rookie. You don't have a backup center right now. Okay. James Ferentz was terrible uh, in, in Saturday's preseason game, gave up two run stops. Hurry, quarterback hit, forget it. I don't think he's making the team. He's also not going anywhere. So if you want to sign him to your practice squad, he'll be here. Uh, Cody Rossi, another backup center. He's hurt. Haven't seen him. Jake Andrews is making the team. He was brought in here to be a backup center. That should be the guy. Um, speaking of guys, Lawrence, Larry, the tackle guy, as I once coined in my first or second year of the beat, and it didn't catch on, but it should, damn it. Uh, Lawrence guy is only down here because, like the other defensive tackles, you know, he might be a captain, he might be a leader, but he got washed out and he got handled one on one at Green Bay. It was one preseason game, but this is also someone who's got a cheap contract. And that if you feel comfortable enough with Sam Roberts, who's a different body than Lawrence Guy, and I poo pooed the idea that, you know, Keon White or Sam Roberts could replace Lawrence Guy strictly in that sense. But I just, something doesn't feel right about here. And it starts, of course, with his mini camp holdout, right? You don't see that a whole lot from captains in Foxborough. He didn't want to talk about it. He's been professional since, and, and credit to him. I just, it, he's not a guy, he's a made guy, okay? He's not a tier above. And that's why he's here. Last one, Chad Ryland. I, I struggle with this. Fourth round rookie kickers should make the team, okay? Based strictly on his draft status, he should be undrafted higher than Steven Goskowski, any specialist under Belichick. They traded it up for him, okay? But he's not run away with the job yet. And Nick Folk is hanging on, man. There's an appreciable difference, of course, between Ryland's leg strength and Nick Folk's. But Riley can kick off. Folk can't. And I just, before I put him all the way at the top tier, I just, I need to see a little more. And folks, folks hanging around. Okay, on to tier three. There can only be one. We have three position battles here. All very low key. As far as position battles go, by the way, training camp has been fairly boring on that front. Here we go. Running back, Kevin Harris or Pierre Strong? Pierre Strong could come back this week. Again, according to Mike Reese of ESPN, dealing with a concussion. That's why I missed um, last week in Green Bay. And practices before that, uh, last, or two Sundays ago now, last Monday and Tuesday, just hasn't done it in camp. Kevin Harris left him, but Pierre Strong plays a little bit more on special teams, might offer something as a returner. You don't know. This last week is going to be big for them, and I think there will only be one on this roster uh, come next Tuesday. Wide receiver, Tyquan Thornton or Kayshawn Booty. I'm not making a pick here yet. I will in a second. Tight end Matt Sokol or Anthony Ferkser. There's a good chance neither of them are on the roster um, until Mike Kosicki got hurt. But let's say we pick three of these guys, right? We have three position battles, 48 players in the two tiers above. So 48 plus three winners out of Kevin Harris or Pierre Strong, Tyquan Thornton or Kayshawn Booty, Matt Sokol or Anthony Ferkser. That's three. That brings us up to 51. 51 out of the 53 before you get to tier four, the bubble boys, okay? Quarterback, Malik Cunningham. Offensive tackle, Connor McDermott. Defensive lineman, Sam Roberts. Linebacker, Calvin Munson. And then cornerbacks, Isaiah Bolden, Sean Wade, Amir Speed, and Joshua Bledsoe. So again, we're going to go back up for a second to there can only be one, okay? And pick between those position battles because I think that's what you really want here. Specifically, Tyke one third and Kayshawn Booty. But when you look at the bubble boys, again, Malik Cunningham, Connor McDermott, Sam Roberts, Calvin Munson, Isaiah Bolden, Sean Wade, Amir Speed, and Joshua Bledsoe, two stand out to me. And two stand out to me for the reason you don't want to hear about. Special teams, baby. The Patriots just cut. Over the last 10 days, about half of their core special teamers, guys who maybe shouldn't have been on the roster in the first place, they're gone. They're down to about four or five. Matt Slater, Brendan Schooler, Chris Board, and I believe it'll be these two guys. Calvin Munson and Amir Speed, for right now, to me, are going to be players number 52 and number 53 on this roster. Amir Speed provides you depth at outside corner. Whatever caliber of depth you see there is up to you, but the guy can fly. He's been on... Four special teams units and was in Green Bay. And so was Calvin Munson. Calvin Munson right now only in the headlines because he was the one who laid the incidental hit on uh, Isaiah Bolden, who right now I, I just, he's got the traits, but he was a seventh round pick. And based on his preseason tape, there's not a lot there where if I'm the Patriots, I'm afraid of losing that guy. 
Okay. And if the mere speed contributes more in special teams, there's the tiebreaker. He's hurt. It's more likely he gets through waivers and we'll put him back in the practice squad. Monson, on the other hand, playing in the second quarter on defense, okay, a downhill linebacker of the type they don't really have uh, as much behind Bentley, maybe to buy. Mac Wilson can go uh, sad, side to side. Um, Mac Wilson, who we mentioned earlier, tier two, he's definitely on the team. I just, the more Munson comes on, I think Munson's the reason Demarcus Mitchell's off this team. That was a core special teamer among those guys that got cut in the last couple of days and made the team outright last year. The team likes Munson. The trouble is he's just got physical limitations. He started a little bit in Miami earlier in his career with the Giants. Action here. This is the year I think he makes a team on special teams and is a backup on defense. And he and Amir Speed are the last ones. Other contenders, Sean Wade's really come on. I mean, he's he's not going to be in any headlines coming out of training camp, but he's around the ball. He can play in the slot. He's seeing some time at safety. Malik Cunningham, again, I just don't think you risk losing him to a team. It's certainly not for playing receiver when you've got the Patriots whatever you think of their receiving core. And I, I just talked about how encouraged I am by them. You're still not putting them in the top half of the league as far as receiving cores go. And quarterback, he's, no one wanted to draft them, and he hasn't shown anything in the preseason that would tell you he could play quarterback in the NFL. One drive against Houston, I know. Connor McDermott's the last one. He's dinged up, and I think you could get him through waivers because he signed with you. He re-signed before free agency started, if you remember back in March. It was one of their first moves. And based on what you saw in the opener against Houston, which I think was a real disservice, to Connor McDermott, he got smoked at left tackle because, of course, he was going to get smoked at left tackle. That guy had been playing right tackle all of camp. Then they throw him out there. He has a false start, gives up a run stuff in the same drive. I think it was a second series. So I think he's someone you could slide through waivers again, or I'm not sure what his time of service, whether he'd just be able to sign with whomever. But either way, these are players, when you look at that group, in terms of how the Patriots value players. Who can contribute for us in two phases? Munson and Speed went out there, and based on their – preseason play and joint practices and where they're trending. I think they're the last two players on the roster. Okay. Everyone else, as I mentioned, is a Turk target guys. I'm sorry. Coach wants to see you next Tuesday. Bring your playbook. You're gone. You're on the street. I think they're going to bring back a lot of the players uh, that they do cut and put them on the practice squad. Let's get to, there can only be one. We have uh, 50 players on the roster. Again, I think the last three are going to come from these position groups, Kevin Harris or Pierre Strong at running back, Tyquan Thornton or Kayshawn Booty at receiver, Matt Sokol or Anthony Ferkser. You might want Johnny Lumpkin, who I've joked in this podcast before, sounds like, uh, you know, the, the name of the childhood bully he might have had or someone in a children's book. Big dude, hulking player, didn't catch passes in college, not going to do it in the NFL. Uh, he and Scotty Washington have pretty much been MIA in camp the last couple of weeks. That's why it's down for me. In addition to just how they're being deployed to Ferkshire and Sokol, better established, known veterans uh, who are were, who were playing better. So let's start there. Uh, I give this spot to Anthony Ferkshire. And it's because he's caught more passes than Matt Sokol. He's uh, more mobile, a player who you can put in the backfield as an F tight end in addition to in line. He's not going to be great in line, but no one is going to be uh, at that point. Um, we have another question coming in. K uh, cans, cans. Hey, Andrew, what do you think will be our strategy to keep Thornton? He will definitely not clear waivers because he's a second round pick, but he's not one of the top five receivers. We're getting there. Not, we're not there. More comments on Thornton. I told you we're getting there. We're saving the best for last. This is how you do a show solo for now. 28 minutes. Look at me. Okay. Uh, Anthony Ferkser gets one of these spots. Matt Sokol on the practice squad. No love lost there. Had a tough week. Uh, that's it. Running back. Again, we're going to close with the receiver battle. Kevin Harris or Pierre Strong? Uh, Kevin Harris let Pierre Strong. Kevin Harris has been available and healthy. He provides, you know, someone who theoretically, and Stevenson would go first, then Zeke Elliott, in short yardage, an option if you wanted. Um, he's also a little bit of an up back on special teams. He gets the spot over Pierre Strong. The only thing really in Pierre Strong's favor at this point is that he was a fourth round pick a year ago and Kevin Harris was a sixth round pick. And I mentioned the return ability. He's got four, three speed. You just don't see it materialize. And when you talk about the return ability, which is, which is real. Okay. Again, mostly based on that speed. And he was on coverage units last year, but had some horrible mistakes uh, that led directly to touchdowns in Minnesota. And then um, Buffalo it's, He's not going to leap Marcus Jones. Okay. He might not leap, you know, Miles Bryant if they ever put him back there on punt team. Kyle Duggar could be a kick returner. So that's just not a path to playing time for him. He has to make an impact as a third down back. And I haven't seen the trust from the coaching staff to let that happen. Kevin Harris, for now, for now, again, I've said a big week. Um, he is the one that gets a spot. 52 players. Okay. Here we go. Tyquan Thornton or Kayshawn Booty. We already have four receivers. All made guys or guys who have to dump dog poo. Robert Kraft's front gate to lose her job. Juju, Devontae Parker. Kendrick Bourne, 
or Demario Douglas. They will be joined in the receiver room, according to yours truly, still a week away from cutdown day by Tyquan Thornton. Second round pick. That's the starting point here in that conversation. And you might not agree. Here's the thing. That's how life goes in the NFL. You're a high round pick. It's a reflection of what the team thought of you in the first place. And it's really hard for teams to shake that first impression. We we talked about uh, Kyle Duggar a few weeks ago on this podcast, reasonable contract projections. I wrote about it for the Herald probably three or four weeks ago. And talking to people around the league about how they formulate contracts and what would be fair. Draft status, even for a player like Kyle Duggar, fellow former second round pick, that is held against you. You were not a first round pick. You deserve less money. That's how it is. However, when it comes cut down day, you'd rather be that high of a pick, even if you disappoint it, because the investment in Keishon Booty, forget like money, just time and energy spent with the guy. He's a six round pick and he's come on strong. He had a really nice touchdown against Green Bay. And he started to return a little bit. But just like Pierre Strong, do you really think he's going to return ahead of Marcus Jones? Isaiah Bolden, if he actually surprised and makes the team? Kyle Duggar, Jabril Peppers, Miles Bryant? No, probably not. Keishon Booty also made that touchdown catch on a slant against 10 yards of cushion in soft zone coverage. And then he ran into open space because the Packer safety took a horrible angle and he went to the house. And credit to him for finishing that play. Honestly, nothing against Keishon Booty. I'm very excited for him. The way that he's progressed throughout camp, this is what you want to see for rookies. He looks like a guy who had a real tough time in college after a breakout freshman year, which, by the way, I don't I don't personally want to hear about it anymore, okay? We're, we're putting everything else about 2020 in the rear view. Worst year of our lives. Great for Kayshawn Booty that he broke out. Let's put that behind us, too. It's 2023, all right? That has less weight and significance and relevance for me with every passing day. Not to mention, we've already seen Kayshawn Booty now for a month in a Patriots uniform between practice and preseason games. I just think that despite his improvement, Tyquan Thornton offers you a skill and an investment that Kayshawn Booty does not. Tyquan Thornton still runs 4-2. I know the coaching staff is encouraged by his development. And part of this are things that you just don't see unless you have the film, okay? The separation he gives, taking the top off the defense. Kayshawn Booty is a possession receiver, former six-round pick. And for a Patriots team to cut him, it doesn't mean you can't bring him back. I don't think if the Patriots cut him, they'll be waving goodbye forever. But when I look at his best plays from the preseason, he had two catches. The other one was a small stick route. Nice job. Good ball from Bailey Zappi stuck in there. But I know Tyquan Thornton's hurt. Maybe he gets the Foxborough flu. That could absolutely be the tiebreaker. Put him on IR. See you next year. Absolutely in the cards. But for right now, I just have a hard time shelving him, knowing how the Patriots operate. Uh, that Kayshawn Booty's 2020 freshman season at LSU and one touchdown that was really gifted just by soft coverage and bad defense is a tiebreaker over a guy that they believed in. They want to believe in and that they spent more time and energy with and offers a skill that four, two speed, not to mention he's six, two and six, three. He doesn't look like it all the time um, that uh, they're going to choose Keishon Booty over him. But the fact that it is uh, this close of a call, if you want to pick Keishon Booty, I'm not going to blame you. I'm just telling you where I stand. It's a credit to Keishon. And it's a tough situation for Taekwon, who obviously we hope gets much better. So that's it. We got the 53. We had five tiers. Um, I think that was a better way to go about this than, again, just going position by position by position. If you want to take Kaishan Booty, you want to take Pierre Strong, by all means, let me know. Hit me up on Twitter or, of course, as we said, uh, in the reviews, Apple, Spotify. We will take whatever you got, but preferably five stars. Help us grow. Things are going great for the pod, heading into what will be an awesome season, I believe, for the Patriots. And if you are going to place a bet, Put your money where your mouth is. Do it at FanDuel, uh, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Okay, I'm going to put some water in my mouth um, where my money has been because it's very dry. Thank you for hanging out on YouTube Live. This is a lot of fun. We didn't get to as many questions as we wanted to, but there is your roster projection. There are your vegetables uh, from the preseason game. We will be back later this week. We're supposed to meet up with Jeff Howe in Nashville, National Insider for the Athletic. Jeff and I are in negotiations because I think he's still going to be in Nashville. We'll try to have him on. And then also some fantasy advice because Thursday will be two weeks from the, the opener. Lions Chiefs, I want to help you in your fantasy league. So we're going to have a fantasy expert uh, whose name I'm going to tease right now. I, I'm, te- I'm going to hide from you uh, along with hopefully Jeff Howe on Thursday. So come back then. We'll have more content, preview the Patriots preseason finale. Football is so close. Thanks for hanging